Welcome, my name is Marcellus Davis, and I will be talking to you today about the African American migration, re resilience, obstacles, and liberation within the state of Minnesota today. On behalf of myself, I want to thank the MELSA organization and the Dakota County Libraries for providing this platform to share with you a little insight about the African American experience. So it is very important to note that um, in our country, home ownership creates wealth. It also helps create generational wealth. Land acquisition and homes help create passing along generational wealth. Unfortunately, in the state of Minnesota, there have been um, macro and micro attempts at the state and the local level to assure that African Americans at different times in the, in, in the history of Minnesota could not become homeowners in certain communities. So we get off into gentrification, we'll talk about redlining, and we'll talk about some communities that you may be very familiar with that, and but not be as familiar with the history. One of the first documented African Americans was by the name of George Bonka. George Bonka was a biracial man. His father was an African American fur trader and his mother was an Ojibwe woman. Uh, George Bonga um, also got married later in his life and um, had a family that resided in the Leech Lake area in which they owned and operated a lodge for many of the years. Some more of the well-documented early travels and settlement of African Americans uh, comes by way of uh, many Southerners traveled to the North for vacationing. To note that slavery was illegal in the state of Minnesota and they would bring their enslaved uh, African Americans with them and uh, Fort Snelling seemed to be a place in which uh, African Americans seemed to be held. So um, the famous Dred Scott or the famous Dred Scott uh, lawsuit uh, happened to be at Fort Snelling as well uh, with his wife Harriet. Another person who happened to be there was James Thompson. Um, a gentleman who found his emancipation in 1837 and uh, stayed in Minnesota and resided um, in Minnesota for the remainder of his life. Another person, and the, the first free emancipated African-American woman in the state, found her uh, emancipation in 1867. Her name is Eliza Winston. Eliza Winston. And then another gentleman who um, in the 1800s was born in Mendota uh, by the name of Joseph Godfrey um, um, was born in Mendota and uh, decided he would fight with the Dakota in the U.S. Dakota Civil War. So early on in the early 1800s, we find different uh, historical figures um, that were African-American in the state of Minnesota. So again, there is a long history, hundreds of years of history of African Americans in the state of Minnesota. It is also important to note that um, many of uh, free um, enslaved African Americans would travel um, by way of the Mississippi River um, to the north. In particular, Minnesota, there were uh, steamboats uh, by the name of Davenport, and by the name of the Norther that will go to Miss Missouri and pick up free enslaved and uh, free African Americans and bring them to the state of Minnesota. There was also a work shortage that was going on during the Civil War, which brought a lot of African Americans 
whom were free to work um, on farms with the army and different various jobs in the state of Minnesota. Important to note that Minnesota has always had a small population of African Americans ranging from 1% to 5% over the course of our time in Minnesota. Um, it is also important to note that um, during the time of 1950 through 1970, one of the times of the great migration of African Americans from the southern states to the northern states and across the nation, we saw a 149% increase of African Americans who inhabited in the state of Minnesota. So it is important to understand that gentrification comes in multifaceted approaches. What is gentrification? Well, the Urban Disinvestment Project defines gentrification as a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change in a historically disinvested neighborhood by means of real estate investment and new higher income residents moving in, as well as demographic change, not only in terms of income level, but also in terms of changes in education and the education level or racial makeup of residents. When we're thinking about gentrification, uh, we want to think about it in three ways. The historic conditions, especially policies and practices that made communities susceptible to gentrification. Example given here, uh, there was a time in the Nokomis community by Lake Nokomis in South Minneapolis about 10 minutes from uh, downtown Minneapolis in which there was a statement that read premises shall not be sold mortgaged or leased to or occupied by any persons other than members of the Caucasian race so one of the ideas that comes out of this whole constellation of city planning efforts is that idea that for a neighborhood to be stable and healthy it had to be racially homogenous that racial mixing in and of itself created an unstable and unhealthy environment. Delagarde said, Men Post, um, from a Men Post article, uh, essentially we were creating communities that were going to be racialized. And if you didn't have the complexion to fit in to the community, you would not be able to get into the community, thus creating racially segregated communities. Delagarde, who uh, I got this quote from, is also the person that helped create the PBS special uh, Jim Crow of the North, which is a phenomenal body of work that really will talk you, teach you about some of the racial patterns and racial segregations that happen in the North. We like to think that these um, examples are only exclusive to the South, but that in fact is not true. It happened all over the country. And Minneapolis is not exempt, nor St. Paul is exempt, nor is Minnesota exempt from these type of racial segregation efforts um, that were backed by policy. So I shared with you a quote about redlining 
as it relates to strict policies that prohibited people of color from moving in communities if they were not white or people of color moving into communities and not being white you could only live there if you were white then another form <clears throat> of gentrification is white flight so when there is um, a non-determinate uh, percentage of people of color that move into a community you start to see whites move out when the feeling that uh, the community is changing and changing is a very subjective term let me say it again with quotes changing so this may look like um, uh, more people of color moving in or maybe some of the the uh, maybe some of the statistics for crime are changing white flight will happen or the education school systems in the schools start to underperform on standardized tests or in these particular schools there is a concern that more students of color are in these schools you will start to see white flight occur you also have this third element this third element where there are thriving communities of color in this sense the african-american community known as rondo in the late uh, 60s uh, was a thriving black community that had black homeowners that had black uh, community uh, businesses that had black doctors that had black schools um, was thriving and then there was this uh, idea uh, by the state of minnesota to create uh, this freeway system um, and this freeway system uh, 94 ran through the Rondo community essentially fracturing and breaking up the Rondo community uh, and then you have disbursement of the residents who happen to be African American throughout the Twin Cities as important you'll never get that you never get that community back to the way it was you'll never get that thriving African American uh, businesses um, and all types of uh, all types of congregation back together the way it once was and that was a state approved uh, fracturing of the African American community so when you think about the 19th early 19th century and the 20th century there were different types of um, initiatives that helped create these enclaves of whiteness to assure that uh, white supremacist policies were being reinforced by making sure that communities were not racially integrated so you can keep your segregation so you think of things like the GI Bill where you have soldiers coming back from the early world wars um, to be able to have uh, housing opportunities but in these housing opportunities most of these housing opportunities had to make sure that they were going to stay white so uh, policies were created and statements were created that assured communities stayed white this passage comes from the national association of real estate boards article 35 1924 a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy members of any race or nationality or any individual whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in the neighborhood so when you have these type of reinforcing white supremacist notions in policy you're going to get racial segregation intentional racial segregation um, as it relates to the minnesota post article it states that minnesota did not have a huge african-american population in the early 1900s matter of fact it was only one percent but the notions of white supremacy were so ingrained that there was intentional efforts made that there would be no integration opportunities for persons of colors and white communities to live together in fact we created policies that assured it would not happen 
you also have this third element, this third element where there are thriving communities of color. In this sense, the African-American community known as Rondo in the late uh, 60s uh, was a thriving black community that had black homeowners, that had black uh, community uh, businesses, that had black doctors, that had black schools, um, was thriving. And then there was this uh, idea uh, by the state of Minnesota to create uh, this freeway system. Um, and this freeway system, uh, 94, ran through the Rondo community, essentially fracturing and breaking up the Rondo community. Uh, and then you have disbursement of the residents who happen to be African-American throughout the Twin Cities. As important, you'll never get that, you never get that community back to the way it was. You'll never get that thriving African-American uh, businesses um, and all types, of, uh, all types of congregation back together the way it once was. And that was a state approved uh, fracturing of the African-American community. Right now we are standing at a little inland of the corner of Plymouth and Penn Avenue, uh, home of the North Side, uh, one of the migration hubs for African-American communities. Uh, prior to 1967, uh, the North Side was primarily a Jewish community, and blacks kind of lived in between 6th Avenue North or 6th Street North and uh, Lindale Avenue. Um, and then in 1967, there was what is known as the Plymouth Riots, and in the Plymouth Riots, uh, uh, African American community members uh, were upset with the discrimination as well as police brutality that was not only happening in Minneapolis, but was happening all over the nation. And then after 1967, Jewish residents kind of migrated westward. And you started to see the numbers of African Americans start to go up a little bit more. But you will see racial patterns throughout the north side and see again uh, a migration hub of African Americans to the north side. And over north, you saw cultural hubs, um, some known as the Way. The Way was a place that helped young African American students or, or, or young African American uh, children grow up, um, the youth development, uh, cultural heritage programs. You saw just a real cultivation of the African American children in the community at this space. And unfortunately, this place was replaced by um, a police precinct. So the real tension is real tension in regards to that, um, that still lingered today in 2020 due to that decision. So there has always been this activism and that activism came from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, uh, also known as the NAACP of St. Paul at the time to assure that there was black protection in black communities around the state of Minnesota. So always fighting against these social impediments, whether it was lynching, whether it was housing, whether it was unfair uh, employment um, uh, acts, uh, there has always been a conscious and concerted effort for black resistance and for black people to stand up and fight back and to fight for the humanity in the state of Minnesota. So you have a lot of African-Americans who are working to change the current position for African-Americans going forward in Minnesota. You have um, uh, the Black Tech Exhibition or Conference. With, so you got people um, uh, uh, who are in the tech realm. You got people who are leading as it relates to health. I believe Commissioner Hennepin uh, County Commissioner Angela, uh, Angela Conley was able to help pass whose revolution resolution declaring racism a public health crisis uh, some of the positive things that have uh, been created and sustained over time for the african-american community you have the minneapolis spokesman a recorder which is the longest acting african-american newspaper beautiful thing still working still uh, telling beautiful African-American stories and still giving the input of African-American Minnesota progression. As well as you have um, 
your urban leagues, you have your NAACPs in, in uh, Minneapolis, a St. Paul chapter, you have a Duluth chapter, you have a St. Cloud chapter. So um, the NAACP is active and there's this vibrancy of young activism uh, with the NAACP right now where you've got political uh, 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 careers being um, developed throughout the state of Minnesota. Different mosaics of, 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 of uh, the cultural, the black cultural aesthetic. We also have juxtaposition. Um, I remember growing up with this brother, Roger Cummins, and his, or his wife, uh, Deanna Cummins. And now it has become his lifelong scholarship and his commitment and the giving back to the community, the brilliance of artists in our communities, in particular black brilliance through art. He has his own place. It's called the Juxtaposition Art Studio. So we are seeing different staples um, of, of black brilliance be created. We, we know that we have uh, Prince as one of the uh, the, the, the musicians that um, not only revolutionized Minnesota, but revolutionized the world. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who were beneficial uh, and beneficiaries as well uh, with the time, as well as Mint Condition, who all helped create the Minneapolis sound, which is still being re uh, uh, replicated today and still received today, still has a large following. So Minnesota has a beautiful, unique, cultural, enrichment uh, talent uh, that not only has uh, transformed Minnesota and put Minnesota on the map throughout the world, but it has traveled and transversed around the world um, so that people can get some type of insight to African American life in Minnesota. Uh, despite some of the historical um, obstacles in the state of Minnesota, Many black Minnesotans are still hopeful that Minnesota can be the place that it was promised in its uh, declarations for the state of Minnesotans. And we are working hard to assure that African Americans are a part of uh, those declarations. We are working hard to remove some of the obstacles that are presently current in education, housing, employment. Um, so you're seeing the revitalization efforts on the north side of uh, Minneapolis. You are seeing uh, the revitalization efforts of making sure that we're commemorating and always remembering the Rondo community. We are making sure that we are also talking about the great lineage of black Minnesotans um, that have helped bring um, attention to blacks in Minnesota. Uh, so uh, this history can not only exclusively be shared from generation to generation of African-Americans, but it must be shared to generation to generation of all Minnesotans. Um, while this is a brief overview of a long history of African-Americans in the state of Minnesota, I implore you to go out and do your own research about the Rondo community. I implore you to go do your research about housing patterns in the state of Minnesota. I implore you to go out and learn a more learn about more of the African American history on the University of Minnesota campus, also known as the Moral Hall Takeover. I want you to understand that black activism in the state of Minnesota has helped create um, a better environment for African Americans, but there is still a long way to go. I want to thank once again Melsa and the Dakota County Libraries for providing this opportunity and platform to share with you a little insight and overview, a paraphrasing of the African American experience. I encourage you to continue to learn more about the African American experience on your own. Um, Read some of the historical newspapers, the Minneapolis Spokesman, which has over 70 years of operation in the state of Minnesota. There is a lot of black historical artifacts that can be read in the Minnesota Historical Society, as well as libraries across the state of Minnesota. And with this, I thank you for your time, and I appreciate your attention being paid to this learning experience that being of the African-American Minnesota experience.